Welcome back to the Barebo Project, episode 51 with Coach Dick Tone. Barebo hunter, Barebo shooter, Barebo coach, Olympic recurve coach, the coach for stars like Casey Coffold and Jay Bars, and just a library of archery information. This is part one, or chapter one of dick tone remember you guys have to pay a fee the fee is to share the show if you enjoyed it if you thought it would help someone if it helped you share the show that's your fee check out our sponsors in the details all right sir my friend welcome to the barebell project how you doing coach you uh you've had a successful indoor season with your athletes so far Yes, it done well, well, real well. We had a good Vegas. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Um, and you had a you had a good classic as well. A couple True. of your other shooters also, you know, um, performed well. So, um, so everybody got some people logging in here. We're at like ten viewers right now on the live feed. Um, I know this is sort of a there's a high, this is a highly anticipated. Um, episode but no they don't know dick that they're going to get three episodes from you <laughs> at least um so for everyone this is episode 51 with coach dick tone um my friend guy that um coaches multiple shooters here in my area and, and shooters that i see including probably the one of the ones that's most well known miss casey coffold with who i'm going to be doing a podcast with soon with her um, Bodie Turner, um, uh, Aaron, uh, Hiab that won the bear bow at classic at the classic. Um, and Liko, if she can make it, and we're not sure if she's going to be able to make it or not, but, um, fun to, fun to watch the kids win everything. It, you know what? It's a, it's a theme right now. Um, for sure. There there's, there's, it's not bear bow. It's across archery there's over in the european nationals right now um there is a 17 year old and a 14 year old uh leading the men's barebow class wow with five they both shot 553s in their first day of competition pretty good shooting Uh, yeah it's real good shooting Uh, uh leo is one of them leo that that shot here at the classic and i'm sure you saw him and another one um I think his name is Oliver. I'm not, I don't remember his last name off the top of my head. I was looking at it earlier, but yeah, it's a theme. There's no question. The kids are, um, the kids are, are blowing it up right now. And, you know, Casey Coffold, who is sort of, uh, well, I guess she's your, your first Olympic birth in some time, um, but not the only, and we'll, we'll get to that. I don't know if that'll be tonight or if that'll be the next episode, but we'll get to that. Um, most recent Olympic birth and, and, and an athlete. Um, but you know, we're, like I said to everyone, we're breaking this into at least two, if not probably three episodes. Um, and if you're coming here to learn about the natural shot shot cycle, you'll probably have to wait till the third episode because Dick and I have been communicating back and forth, uh, quite a bit over, well, I'll be honest with you. We kind of, ever since I took your seminar with Jay, Jay bars and I uh, well, and my friend, Justin, Hughes came for a visit and kind of uh, was there for the weekend as well. We've kind of been in constant contact since then. Um, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for what and how you teach. Um, I have quoted you like a lot of, a lot of the things that you talked about during your seminar and stuff um on the podcast and amongst coaching and stuff like that and i honestly always give you credit especially like you know stuff one of the things that stuck out to me when you're talking about like you know uh like take care of your affairs you know get you know stuff like that um just always stood out to me as such a and we'll we'll i'm not gonna ask you to sell the farm but as we go through this you can you can give away whatever you want to and obviously you talk about your seminars and stuff, but this first episode, after talking with Dick um, repeatedly over the last few months um, and then leading up to this podcast, you know, you really come to find out that 
when someone's been involved in the sport as long as Dick has, there is just a library of knowledge to be able to pull from. I will also say this out of all of the coaches that I have worked with, um, been trained by, or um, just have knowledge base of, um, there are very few that really have a as well-rounded of a coaching background as Dick Tone. And that's one of the reasons that he's here. Um, and when I took his seminar and I was having the back issues that I talked about quite a bit over the last few weeks and issues that sort of resurfaced right before the classic a little bit, um, Dick was the one that helped me find the uh, a more... I'm going to use the word natural way to at least get to full draw to help alleviate that issue. And it, that issue had, had started. That was, I want to say that was June of last year. Was it June? Maybe I think. Um, not supposed, it was not supposed to hurt to shoot. Yeah. I was <laughs> definitely, I was definitely hurting. And, and we talked about that and, and you can, you can elaborate on some of that stuff as, as you go. Um, but because I talked to I talked to Dick about kind of his early career and how this whole archery thing got started, um, we decided to break this up and talk about the early stages because I think I think another thing to remember is is that Dick is a is a barebow guy at heart, um, and you can get into your barebow history, my friend, um, and talk about you know your beginnings and your career and you know, I, I honestly kind of don't necessarily want you to leave any detail out um, if you think it's relevant. So anyways, Mr. Dick Tone, welcome to the Barebell Project. The stage is yours, sir. Where do we even start? There's so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I can start by how I got into archery to start with. And, um, you know, I was born in Minnesota and uh, my dad and mom were, you know, born and raised in North Home, Minnesota. Uh, and they all had big families and my dad had a bunch of brothers and, and you know, they lived off the land. I mean, they had to go out and shoot deer and stuff like that um, just to survive, you know, just in a log cabin. And, um, and he ended up going to the University of Minnesota and, you know, ended up uh, working for Standard Oil and, and um, decided that wasn't for him after we'd had a couple of floods in Mankato and flooded our house. And so they decided we're moving to Arizona. We had, uh, he had a, we have a great uncle, my great uncle that had homesteaded out here. And so they decided to just move out here. Didn't have a job, just hooked up the trailer and put a bunch of stuff in it and drove out here. Well, a long drive for <clears throat> a five and a six year old. And, uh, my mother spent the whole time telling us about cowboys and Indians because we're going to the West. And uh, so, you know, there's all these stories about it. And, you know, how she, here she was a Norwegian and Sweden had black hair or really dark brown hair. And she was telling us she was part Indian, which came back to haunt her. But uh, anyway, on, on the way, you know, we, we, and we become very, you know, romanticized with the West. And uh, we rented a house up on the north part of Phoenix. And there was an old man that was three or four uh, houses down that um, saw us out there playing, you know, cowboys and Indians, stuff like that. But nobody had a bow. So he cut um, a uh, oleander stave and, um, and then made, took an orange crate and the slats in the orange crate split them and, you know, took a knife and shaved them down and made arrows. And so I had a bow and I killed more cactus around that house. Than you can believe, you know, just <laughs> swinging arrows, you know, five, five year old kid. And uh, that kind of started the whole thing. And it seemed like every where I went, you know, we moved several times in Arizona. Every time I went somewhere, I'd find something else that I can make a bow out of and something else I could make arrows out of. Hmm. And, uh, and of course, there was no idea of what was good. You know, we just shot arrows. And then uh, my cousin came out from Minnesota and, uh, 
for Christmas one year. I think we were eight. I was eight and um, went to a hardware store and they bought us a Ben Pearson uh, archery set. Bought us both the same set. And it was a 20 pound lemon wood Ben Pearson bow. I mean, we're talking about a real bow. I was excited. You know, some a few arrows, a finger tab and an arm guard. I didn't know there was such thing as finger protection. <laughs> so, you know, it was pretty cool. And so the two of us, we, you know, we didn't take long. So we broke all our arrows and had a great time doing it and had to make our own arrows and whatever. But that was my first, I guess, real bow. And then shortly thereafter, I uh, ended up getting a uh, Ben Pearson static recurve 35 pound hickory bow which I still have. Oh, yeah. And uh, so now I'm, I'm, you know, I was nine or something like that. And uh, there was a local archery club called uh, Sun Valley Bowhunters. And it was a field course. And of course, out there at that time, there was no such thing as marked yardage. And most of the targets were animal targets and that kind of stuff. And so my dad would take me out there after church on Sunday and, and let me go and then come back and get me at dark. You know, so I got to know all the shooters, and I remember one time I I, I got out there and uh, and I, I shot a few arrows and my bowstring broke, and I had no spare bowstring. I didn't know what to do, and uh, this nice old man came up and gave me a bowstring. Guy's name was Al Henderson. Okay, I don't know if you remember that guy, but. Very I know that I do coach. know that name, but I cannot put a face to or very famous it. archery coach yeah, and okay. the archery whole thing. And um, <clears throat> anyway, um, that let me shoot the rest of the day, and you know we continued doing that until I um, they had an archery shop in town town called the Bowman's Hogan, and we would go there, and I was just enamored with all the the bows and arrows, and I thought it was the smell when you came in there of you know feathers burning and all that kind of stuff it was just that was an archery shop right. i mean that was old timey and they had bows in there that were uh made by gordon now gordon glass is what was on most of the bows you know over the years mm -hmm. and gordon used to have their own line of bows and there was a golden gordon page the queen and the king and the, all the things of you know the knights and all that kind of stuff Sure. And so I ended up getting a Gordon Page 40 pound semi recurve. I thought I was something, <laughs> right? And so now I'm, I don't know, 11 or 12 or something like that. And, uh, you know, going and shooting field courses and just having a good time. And my dad come in one day and said, We're moving to Canada. Well, he was with State Farm and started an agency in Arizona. And then ended up in in, in management, and uh, they they picked him to start the State Farm in Canada. So he had to go up there. He's going to be there for three years and get us started in Canada. So he was a regional vice president of State Farm for Canada. Well, across the street from where we moved, there was this huge ravine, and you know kids. Bows and arrows, ravine, yep. the yep. neighbor, we'd go in there. I mean, every day after school, didn't matter. Winter, doesn't matter. And when we go to the ravine, and it was quite a ways down in there, we get to the top, and there was always there was a stump down there that we always shot our first arrow at. And it had to be 80 yards, you know. And we'd always shoot an arrow to see who get closest. And then we spent the rest of the day doing nothing but stump shooting. And if there was an animal, it was in trouble. We didn't uh, care if it was a muskrat or a, <laughs> a, a rabbit or what time of year it was or you know, a fox. We didn't care. We were gonna we we're gonna shoot it, and uh, so that's what we did. I mean, it just you know, day after day, and then in the winter, of course, we had to play hockey, you know. But uh, we still went over there in the winter and trudged around. Um, came out of there one day, and we were walking back to the house, and a car pulled up. Guy rolled down the window and he said, Hey, you guys like archery? And he says, Yeah. And he says, uh, We have a target archery club over here. You ought to come try it. And I said, What's target archery? Had no clue. So I went over there. And how, how old were you about this time? 
I was 13, I think, at that time. And um, I went over there, and here are these people all standing at one spot, shooting all their arrows from one spot at this huge, big target. And I thought, how hard can this be? I mean, really? You know, so I would shoot with them. Well, what I didn't know, they all had sights. Yeah. I have sight, you know, but I was keeping up with them. I thought, well, if I'm going to beat them, I better get a sight. Well, here I am with a corner of the mouth anchor, and you can't get much distance with a sight. Right. So I ended up with a prism sight, which was a sight that would deflect the target. All right. So now I could be corner of the mouth and still get the distance. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I didn't change my form. I just changed the, the sight. And uh, I went to my first tournament, which was the Ontario Provincial Championships as a junior. And, um, uh, you know, there's supposed to be a hotshot kid there that was, you know, he was the guy that was going to kick everybody's butt in my division, you know. So I, I didn't know. I just went up there and shot. At the end of the day, I had a 50 point lead on him. Nice. And I thought, damn, he's good. He'll catch me tomorrow. And so now I'm nervous. <laughs> Before that, I was fine. <laughs> anyway, I picked up another 50 the next day. And I think from that point on, I was up there for six years. Uh, I only came second once. And that was because it was a fetish tur tournament mm -hmm. and they didn't allow prisms. Okay. So then I had to change my anchor to learn how to shoot under the chin mm -hmm. and consequently ended up second. And anyway, six years, never lost a tournament. The last tournament I shot up there was the Canadian Nationals. I was 18 and I um, uh, had been working with a young lady named Joan McDonald. Okay. And she was three, four or five years older than I was. And then another guy named Brian Leonard who was about my age or a little bit younger. And I shot the senior division back then. They had two days of target. They had a day of clout and archery golf, things like that. And then they had two days of field. And uh, they had a target champion, a field champion, and a combined champion. So I won the target. And I won the field. I won the combined. And the guy who was second was right around 400 points behind. <laughs> so that was the last turn of my shot out there. Joan, uh, Joan Galley at the time uh, won the women's and Brian uh, Leonard won the intermediate. Oh, wow. So that was my first uh, foray into teaching people how to shoot. Okay. Now, how that all happened was I was, you know, I would get help from people up there, but they didn't know either. They were just saying, well, this is what you're doing. And, uh, uh, I was looking at an Archer World magazine, and there was a guy in there that. Watch your hands, Dick. I think your hands are on the computer or something, and where the mic is on your computer. Okay. So, anyway, there was a guy up there that wrote articles called Dave Keggy, and he wrote a book called Power Archery. Mm hmm. And I, I thought, well, maybe he got a better way of shooting. So I got a hold of that book and read it. And I tried to put it into some sort of a, uh, you know, way of shooting, reading the book. And um, it worked better than what I was doing by far. And so there was no question when I went to a tournament whether I was going to win. It's like, who was going to be second? And uh, so, you know, people wanted to learn how to do this. And so that's where that all started, you know, basically teaching. Right. What I didn't know, what I didn't know was that his book was based on uh, a book that was written by uh, Chester Say in 1930. And it was called Shooting the Longbow, the Relax Method. Okay. okay. And um, as, as luck would have it, I actually got to meet uh, and had lunch with him. He and Doug Easton there, and when I was working for Easton, and I had no clue even then he had written a book. It was several years later that I figured it all out, you know. And I talked to Dave because oh, Dave's still alive. He lives here in the Phoenix area, mm -hmm. and um, I asked him. I says, "You just updated this, didn't you?" And he's, "Well, yeah, exactly." And he says, and he took this 
power archery stuff. And he taught his kid, Dave, how to shoot. And back then, um, in 1961, I think, or 62, back then we didn't have stabilizers, none of that stuff. And um, uh, Dave Jr. went down to uh, Jones Beach where they had the Nationals, NAA Nationals. And um, 16 years old, shot in the men's division and kicked everybody's butt, won the national championship. All right. And everybody says, well, you can't shoot that way. Yes, you will. Can't shoot what way? Oh, the, the power power the archery. Power archery way. He says, yeah. you just can't do that. I mean, that, that doesn't work. It won't be good. It won't this and that. And he says, Dave says, well, he did beat everybody. Yeah, but he was lucky. You know how that goes, right? But it that basic form is pretty much what we teach. Um, and we have done a few things to make it easier for the body. And, you know, uh, you know, you look at the physics of the shot and, and marry it with the biomechanics and everything gets, gets a lot easier. So the physics of the shot were there with our archery. And, um, you know, you, you apply it to what we know in biomechanics today and it, it gets a lot easier. So yeah. that's kind of how it all started. So Okay. All right. Well, um there's a there's a question I, I i think i know the answer but i'm gonna let you um answer it they're just they're asking uh allison eaton said is anchoring under the chin while shooting barbell harmful to the bow due to more extreme string walking i'm assuming you weren't string walking back then at all no it's an all split finger corner of the mouth yep split finger yep. corner of the mouth and that was 90 meters well that yes. was, you know, back then, um, yeah, well, the feeders were 90. Of course, yeah. they weren't 90 for a junior. But, oh, okay. Uh, you know, they were right. you know, 70 or whatever. Okay. I think it was 70. I think it was 90, when, 90, when 70, went, 60, 50 for the classes. And then when when I went to shoot in the site and everything, you had to learn to shoot under the chin. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, you're, then you're shooting 90. Okay. And back yeah. then... When back then there was no stabilizers uh, the, the clicker hadn't been invented none of that stuff well it had been invented but nobody was using it <laughs> sure so, but, um yeah, yeah right i we we talked about that so you were using a site no clicker at that point right and um your teaching and stuff obviously started pretty early let's go through how you you have um i really this episode I really want to dive into your coaching background because it's extensive, um, both here in America and in Canada. And I think some people don't know that. So can we, can we talk about like, uh, well, we don't need to go into detail about your competition side and stuff. You kind of talked about that already, but let's, let's dive into like, all right, Dick Tone, the shooter, has kind of come and gone. Um, you've done your thing. When did the coaching bug really hit you in a, in a little bit of a higher way? And I think what got you back into it? Um, I moved back to Phoenix, um, go to college, Phoenix College, and then eventually ASU uh, and uh, San Bernardino Valley College, whatever. Um, and uh, when I moved back, um, I actually uh, got involved with Al Henderson. He had an archery shop. Okay. And the yeah. same guy that, that got mm -hmm. that bowstring from way back. Yeah. And this was 1965. And um, the trials for the US team were coming up. And so I needed uh, another bow. And I needed a coach. And he was supposed to be a good coach. So. I'm, I'm working with him and I ended up shooting an American archery bow um, only because it got there before Hoyt did <laughs> and we had to get this done hurry <laughs> anyway. Um, and he didn't agree with the power archery part and he convinced me that maybe you ought to do it this way and so on and so forth. And in the long run, it probably hurt me more than helped me, but I, I ended up making the team anyway and went to, Sweden shot the world championships and um, I think I ended up fifth in the team. I was on the team. We won the gold. Um, so that was good. And then when I got back and I was working for Al, um, 
for a little bit there. And then I ended up going to California and uh, over there um, shooting a lot of tournaments and uh, working with different people, but not really coaching, but helping them out, you know, sure. mainly kids in college. And where that started is I went to San Bernardino Valley College and I got there late. And so in order to get classes, you had to go around at that time and have the professor sign off on it so you could get into the class. And I went to, and nothing fit my schedule in archery. They had archery there. Lorraine Pozzola was the teacher and or the coach and uh, nothing fit my schedule. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll just take beginning golf or beginning archery, right? And I'll shoot left-handed, all right? <laughs> And they'll never know the difference. <laughs> I'll just have fun, right? So I went to the coach's office, Lorraine Pozzola, and I gave her the thing to sign. And she, she got ready to sign it. And she looked at it. And she goes, she put it on her desk. And she opened a desk drawer and pulled out the Archer World magazine. And turned around. She says, is that you? <laughs> and I says, yeah. She says, no, you're not going to do this. <laughs> uh, so she wouldn't let me in the class. So now we're button heads. And I said, all right, I'll just take golf. So I got into an intermediate golf thing. So they're over there shooting arrows and, and I'm hitting golf balls. And, um, and she would come over and say, could you just shoot a couple for people? <laughs> and then I'm going to this and that. And then, of course, then the first intercollegiate nationals was coming up. She wanted to know if I would be on the team. I says, you won't let me in a class. Now you want me to be on your team? I says, no. I said, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of your kids in the class. I'm going to teach them how to shoot and they'll win. And she says, you wouldn't. I says, I'm going to. Yeah. And I did. <laughs> That's awesome. And kid, yeah. And the kid won the first intercollegiate nationals turned out to be a, ended up a really good friend, uh, a musician and, and, um, and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so that's kind of, you know, where I, I got into coaching and I ended up coaching, I don't know how many intercollegiate champions over the years back when it was a big deal. Right. Um, I, I looked at the list once and it was, I, was, I couldn't believe how many, you know, men and women that I had, you know, coached. Uh, Steve Lieberman lives in your area, lives okay. in Reading, okay. Um, he uh, was in Arizona, uh, came out from there and went to Arizona State and I was running Henderson's after I got out of the army and um he oh, you're a veteran and, I didn't know you were a veteran okay. oh yeah awesome uh, I'll, I'll tell you about that part in a minute okay, okay. Anyway, thank you for your Steve service came in, <laughs> <laughs> Steve came into the shop one day and I knew who he was and he walked up and he put put his aluminum arrows on the counter you know and back then it was all aluminum and I had an eastern pro shop straightener on the counter and oh, he yeah, says yeah he says, I, uh, I'm Steve Lieberman. I want my arrow straightened. <laughs> I said, I picked him up and I says, I'm Dick Tone. It's 50 cents a piece. <laughs> that's how it started. You know? Well, that's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, there's a lot of people, Dick, that don't, I, I mean, I grew up in an archery shop, you know, like from a super young age, my dad had one mm -hmm. out back and I was like, six years old and spent the majority of my teenage years up until like 19 in an archery shop. And, you know, Justin Hewish grew up the same way. And, and there's a bunch of us that ironically are still involved in the sport in some capacity. And, you know, there's just some back in the day, archery shops still have that feel, but there was just something different about the camaraderie of going into the shop. You it have those, those guys that, you know, and like you said about the smell of like the burning feathers, the smell of Fletch tight. Cause that's all we had. Right. Um, you know, the, it just, just the whole dynamic of you hear the arrows hitting the targets, you hear the BS going behind the counter, everybody's talking shit. Like there's always animals hanging on the wall. Like, like I'm probably describing, 85% of the archery shops across America right now, but they're so far less than they used to be. Oh, and yeah, very much yeah. the techno hunt going and like even that stuff, you know, you my, that's techno hunt was early in my, my childhood uh, or no late in my childhood, I should say it got big. 
it was long you were involved long before techno hunt was even a thing but (laughs) and i'm just describing that because like there's there's a feel to walking into a shop like that's a shop shop like a a bow hunter shop but then when they have a range and and a target range and you're shooting daily and stuff like that it's just it's an undescribable feeling and it's one of those things that i think uh, it, it it sets the hook for archery for some people do you know what i mean it did for me as a kid for sure there's no question but anyways continue yeah this is great stuff well if you go back to california because um when i went when i when i lived in california and went to san Bernardino valley college um which was a good time and then you know you you get in in fights with your parents and you know your kids and this and that and and so i decided that i didn't need to go to college anymore i'm i'm going to go do something else right and so i my folks were out of town and i borrowed one of the cars and i drove up to the state target and as an amateur there wasn't anybody going to beat me so i was just going to be there right and for some reason i couldn't hit anything i was it was horrible Right. And Steve uh, Hayes, who ran the, the uh, uh, aero department at Easton at the time, you know, he and I are friends. He said, what's, what's wrong with you? And I says, well, I says, I'm not going back to college. I borrowed my mom's car. Uh, I got a quarter tank of gas and I don't have enough money to buy gas to go home. I don't have a job and I don't know what I'm going to do. And you can see, just see that everything going on in my mind was keeping me from shooting well. Sure, I get that. So the next morning, Steve came over and he says, uh, uh, this guy here is going to give you a job. And it was Doug Easton. No way. All right. So we have a job for you in this aero straightening. And I says, okay. And he says, uh, you can stay with me and my wife until we find that you can find an apartment or something. And, and so uh, you're set. Well, by that time I was so far behind, it was hard to catch up, but I came within a couple of points of winning and <laughs> didn't win the thing, you know, <laughs> but now I'm, now I'm working for Easton. So you won, right. you won that weekend, regardless Let's right. go that way. So I'm working for Easton in the aero straightening department. All right. And we would straighten arrows and when you'd straighten arrows you'd end up with arrows that had what we call cranks they were straight when you spun them but you look at the ends and they could see that they were still bent on the ends yeah yep well they would give you a pro shop straightener and you could go home and straighten these and they'd pay you i don't know it was 10 cents a piece or whatever it was and so man i'm gonna do that because i'm making a buck 75 an hour right <laughs> yeah which was Good money back then it was better than than minimum wage right yep and um uh, so doing that and i was working uh, it was kind of fun i work in uh, overtime on a saturday one day and uh jim easton came in and he said uh, does anybody know how to type i says i do and he said can you run an ibm executive i said sure so he ran me up to mary's office mary easton's office and he says, I need this typed up with, you know, with two copies and envelopes. And I says, all right. So I typed it all out and made the envelopes. And I went back and I was back there straightening arrows. And Jim come in. He says, did you get that done already? And I says, yep, here it is. And what it was is was a proposal for NASA that a friend of his had come up. He was a cryogenic engineer. He'd come up with this idea of making an insulation shroud to go on a seismometer for the Apollo space project. Oh, wow. And so I typed this all out and I thought it was kind of interesting, right? About a month later, Jim come into the straightening and he says, uh, NASA come back and they want a prototype to test. Would you like to help build it? I said, sure. Yeah, no brainer. We're gonna be in here in the evening doing it. So I go over there and neither one of these guys that ever made a model airplane, I can tell you that. So they didn't <laughs> know what they're doing. So basically, <laughs> You know, they had the thing and I built it and, you know, we sent it off. And every night I was there doing this, Jim would hand me a $20 bill. 
well, that's more than I'm making during the day. I'll be here every night. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we sent it off. And then it was about a month later. They want that they come back and they said they approved it. And we need 12 of them. Wow. And Jim, Jim said, would you like to head up the project? And I said, sure. So we had to make a, you know, a white room, a clean room and set it up and, you know, in a progressive way so I could, you know, go from one to the other and, and build these things. So I built 12 of them and um, we sent them off to NASA with the big crates for each one and all that kind of, it was, it was quite a project. And um, then when the project was over, uh, I got fired. Oh, boy. wow. Because Doug Easton, even though he and I had been dove hunting and we're good friends i'd stay at his house all kind of stuff uh, he did not like the project because it wasn't eastern arrows it wasn't right. okay yeah and he and he and jim were button heads well when they're button heads and i'm in between it you know i gotta go not a great yeah son. not a great you place know? to be yeah so I, I even went down and sat down with him i said hey what's the deal and he said it isn't you he says, I just can't fire him. So I've got to fire somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he doesn't fire, if he, if he fires you, then that project doesn't come back and it's all East and Arrows again. So. Yeah. So anyway, um, you know, I went over and I worked for a guy named Hugh Rich, Hugh Rich Archery. And he was, uh, if you read the book, The Legends of Archery, mm -hmm. you know, he's one of them. You look in there. All right. Okay. And uh, I would build arrows for him. They had a, uh, uh, a table, a couple of tables with 60 bits and burgers on them. And you'd run these tables and I could run, you know, feathers, sorting feathers and putting them on glue and putting them on by hand with a blue uh, tube, right? I could run that table in 10 minutes and then run the other table. And then we had um, uh, heat lamps on them to dry them quicker. Oh yeah. Wow. And I would do, I would do about 60 dozen arrows a day. Well, lots oh, of things. Better and, you than me. Uh, what's that? <laughs> Better you than me. I can't. I loathe fletching arrows. I'll just well, back then it was a job, you know. I did it when I was a kid. That's probably why. It was one of those things. Put the kid to work so um, it stays out of trouble, kind of thing. Go over to the fletching table. That's what I got. <laughs> but we had uh, we had a guy that uh, came in there all the time named Bob Markworth, who was being inducted in the Hall of Fame here, and he was a trick shooter. And he would shoot blindfolded and shoot a balloon out of his wife's mouth. Sounds like one of the Wilhelms. <laughs> yeah, well, that kind of guy. And he yeah. would not let anybody make arrows for him but me. Really? So, That's cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But And I've known he's still around. So Awesome. In fact, he was just on uh, uh, one of the talk shows or whatever not too long ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Anyway, um, during the time working with you, since I wasn't in college anymore, I got drafted. And I didn't know that till I went home and then you know, I had a, some mail there. And I, you know, my mom says, there's a mail for you. And I opened, I looked one, it says bear archery. And I said, oh, nice. Opened it up, you know, I was shooting for bear at the time. And it was an invitation to move to Grayling, Michigan and run the bear museum. Wow. And then the next letter I opened was from Uncle Sam. It says, we want you. <laughs> oh, man, the timing. Dick, well, the I didn't timing. get to go and run the Bear Museum. I had to go to the LA Induction Center and end up in basic training in uh, Fort Ord, California. <clears throat> and, uh, and during basic training, it's kind of funny how things work out, but during basic training, they say, you don't ever volunteer for anything in the army. I said, okay, you know, and uh, the way they pick people to go into different things when you get at the LA Induction Center, when you're, you're getting, you give your oath and they're all sitting in the room on these, you know, folding chairs and they, they say, count off in threes. So they count, we all count off in threes. So, okay, number ones, all you ones stand up, you're in the Navy. All right, they had to leave. All you twos, you're in the Marines. All you threes, you're in the Army. I was a three, so I had an Army. Thank God. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so 
anyway, after basic training or during basic training, they say, don't volunteer for anything. Well, they come around one day and said, it's, uh, if you would like to uh, uh, apply to be a clerk typist, um, you can volunteer to try out. I says, well, I do know how to type and they've got to be better than running around shooting people. So I'll try. So I raised my hand and I went over there and here's all these guys sitting in the room hunting and pecking and this and that. And, and uh, back then I could type uh, 110 a minute. And so I was typing all these five minute <laughs> tests and stuff like that and no mistakes and all that kind of stuff. And just hand them in. Then that was it. You leave. You don't know. Right. right. And then a few weeks later, the DI has all lined up and he says, anybody want to be a chaplain's assistant? If you want to try for that, he says, you have to go here at such and such a time. I thought, I'll do that because I'd gone to a, a Lutheran Academy for four years, knew a lot sure. about religion, all that kind of stuff. Can't be that bad. You know, what I didn't know, <laughs> you're going to be the person <laughs> protecting the chaplain <laughs> wherever you go. Oh, OK. You know that. But anyway, so I went there and, and they got like a couple hundred guys in there trying to do this. And uh, they had, and gave everybody a piece of paper and to write down in, the, in a few years uh, words why you want to be a chaplain's assistant. So I wrote it down, everything, and, got, and they took all the pieces of paper, and then they came back, and they said, everybody can leave except these five guys. And that was I was one of them. And I said, well, that's kind of weird. And the guy, everybody left, and he said, I suppose you want to know why we kept you five guys. Yeah. Well, you're the only five guys that spelled chaplain correctly. <laughs> so, so then you get interviewed in front of a, you know, a priest and, a, and all these different people, you know, in the religion, they interview you, which was a simple deal. And then you don't know. But at the end of basic training, they list what your MOS is, what you do in the army. Yeah. And so you got a list there. And we're all going down and this guy's an 11 Bravo with this guy's that and so on and so forth. And, I'm at the bottom and it says zero, see the DI. I go, okay. So I went to the drill instructor and I said, what's the deal? He said, well, you have a choice. And I says, really? The army doesn't give you choices. And he says, yeah. you have a choice. You can be a clerk typist or a chaplain's assistant, whichever you want. I says, tell me about it. Well, if you're a chaplain assistant, we're going to send you somewhere in Virginia and you go through training and all that kind of stuff. And then you'll be assigned to a chaplain. And I says, and the Kirk typist, you have a, a one week leave and you're going to report to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, or no, was it? Yeah, in Clarendon Hills, Illinois. Okay. And I says, all right, I'll do that. It comes with a week leave. I'll take it. Right. Sure. So I'm home for a week and I get a phone call or my you know, seven in the morning. And there's a guy from Fort Carson, Colorado, that's a detachment, CID detachment for uh, whatever from up in Fort Sheridan. that says, we need a clerk typist here and it would be better here than up there. He said, would you like to do that? So I get another choice. I says, Colorado Springs, Fort Sheridan, I'll take Colorado Springs. So sure. ended up there. And um, managed to piss off a couple of warrant officers after I was there for a while. Yeah. And uh, they put me on a name levy, meaning you are going to Vietnam. If it was an MOS levy, I could have gone to personnel and they got me out of it, right? Right. But no, it's a name list. I really pissed them off, right? The next, off. Day, the next day, I got a phone call from Jim Easton. He says, NASA was doing some tests on these insulation shrouds in a vacuum chamber the windows came in and blew up about four of them we need more of them you're the only one who knows how to build them we need you to come to california and do that and i said sorry jim i'm yeah. on a name Libby. i'm going to vietnam he says let me see what i can do and of course the next day this warrant officer come in the one i pissed off he had a big stack of orders and he said I don't know who you are but what or what you do, but you have 24 hours to get your butt to Hollywood. No way. <laughs> yeah, he had called his senators and all that people, and they and of course doing something for NASA, it preempted everything. Sure. 
Sure. So I, I ended up with 60, 60 days excess leave in uh, literally in uh, Hollywood. They had a suite set up where I could build these things and then write a manual on how to do it. Right. Oh, my goodness. So it was right next door to a talent agency for young ladies. So it wasn't too bad. You know, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we got that done and then they sent me off the mound. OK, so you had a 60 well, day reprieve. Yeah, you had a 60 day reprieve and yeah, worked for NASA essentially through Easton. Yeah. And, and then and then off to Vietnam. How long were you in Vietnam? I was there for a year or well, not quite a year. Um, had um, a matter of fact, when in July, I got there the first part of July. And, and then when the when the Apollo 11 went up uh, with the stuff and I and we're watching on a black and white TV in Nam. And they, you know, guys and I said, I tell them, I says, I, I built that thing right there. And they're, and they're going, oh, yeah, sure you did. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were putting it on the moon, you know. Sure. There's actually four of them up there. But uh, the fun part when I was there, um, uh, I ended up being a uh, uh, headquarters company. And um, so in Cameron Bay. And then we would have, um, I, I got my archer equipment shipped over so I could practice. Oh, okay. And, um, and I made sure that nobody sent me a clicker. I didn't want a clicker. I wanted to go back to where I used to shoot. <laughs> and, um, we like that. <laughs> and so every time, every time they had a USO show come to my local area, and that, uh, I would open it up with a with a show. Really. So I would do everything from, you know, shooting stuff with the like Olympic recurve stuff. And then I'd end up shooting stuff out of the air and, you know, all kind of stuff. Um, and it was just, you know, a fun deal. You know, so I had always put on there that I was a professional archer, you know. So it was it was easy to do. And then to do that, they would give you a phone or give me a phone call home. You know, back then there were no cell phones or no other way. And so get a cell phone or a phone call home, it was worth it, you know? Oh, wow. And, uh, so that was, uh, that's how I ended up in Nam and ended up doing that. I have some pictures I'll show you from doing shows over there. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So but, uh, that was fun. Yeah. And then when I came back to the United States, I uh, spent a little time in California, maybe a couple of weeks and then off to Arizona and run at Henderson Archery. Um, and, um, is this after you were discharged or? That was after I just discharged, yes. And that was um, 1970, okay? Yep, still so wasn't born, just, just so you, you know. You weren't born. I wasn't born yet, no. Nope. <laughs> well, let me know when you get to the point where you were born. I will, I will. <laughs> we'll see where you well, were in archery at that point. So from 70 to 73, I ran Henderson's. And um, that's where I met my wife. She uh, was going to ASU and she was shooting for ASU. Oh, okay. She came down to Henderson's. Um, in matter of fact, when she was high school, she came to Henderson's with another uh, young lady to get a lesson. And I was preparing to go to the Calgary Stampede to do a show. And when she came in, I was standing there shooting aspirins off golf tees. She thought that was impressive. So <laughs> that was part of the show. So. Sure. Anyway, um, and I did end up, I ended up going up there and um, I did uh, 10 days, two shows a day. We had, you know, between 500,000 people at every show. Wow. That's and crazy. We were, we were voted the most professional of the whole Calgary Stampede. Wow, that's really cool. Good. Yeah, I remember um, going to shows. I remember going to shows when I was a kid. My dad took me to a, uh, uh, it was like a, uh, what do you call them? Like in it, I'm trying to think what the, the name of it is like a, like an Indian. I don't even know what it was. There's they, they had these like Western shows and stuff. And yeah. wouldn't you know, Byron Ferguson was actually at the show. I was young. I might've been five or six years old and it was, you know, I, I don't think Byron, well, I don't think at that point Byron was quite as, as popular as he is even to this day, obviously, but, and he was shooting aspirins and all that stuff and doing what Byron does. And it's kind of full circle life for me. Like I come to ended up meeting Byron with, um, with, with uh, Larry Wise and Doc McCune and, and Doc is friends with Byron and, and actually is, has visited his ranch numerous times. And then 
you know, it's just, it's just like full circle for me as a kid, somebody like that, I was introduced to, had no idea who it was, you know, and now it, same with you. I didn't even know that you did those shows, but I knew who you were from my childhood um, competing in FIDA. I knew who you were. And then, you know, come full circle, like here you are on the podcast telling your story. So it's kind of nostalgic for me hearing these things because it's leading up to like me. I'm not even born yet. And I'm hearing this stuff that I didn't even know about you. And, and I'm willing to bet that the majority of the archery world doesn't know a lot of this, except for the few people that you have spoken about. So, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of history and I'm a fan of the story that has created shooters like Casey Koffel and, and multiple gold medalists at this point, stuff like that. So I think it's just all it's, I, in my opinion, it's all relevant, but anyway, so moving forward. Well, there's, there's a lot of aspects to archery people don't realize. I mean, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I, I remember going to Ivanpah dry Lake when I worked for, uh, for Hugh Rich with uh, Don Brown was uh, my roommate at the time. We rented an apartment together and uh, we'd go there to shoot flight shooting. I don't know if you've been involved in that at all. No. But, you know, basically you're trying to see how far you can shoot an arrow, right? Okay. Yeah. National championships and all that kind of stuff on it. And uh, Don held a lot of, or still does hold the handheld record. Uh, how far do you think that is? I'm going to say 400 yards. 400 yards. I've shot him over 800. Okay. With 80 pound, with an 80 pound flight pole. He's 1300 and some yards. And wow. Hand well, just short crazy. of a mile. Okay. And we're, we're talking compounds here? Recurve. Re really? Compounds haven't beat a recurve yet on that. Really? Really. Somebody out there is going to. This is probably mulling us over now. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, anyway, uh, matter of fact, uh, the bow that Don set that record with uh, is sitting back here on the wall. Well, let's, what is it? We'll, it's, we'll look at it next time. Yeah. Okay. No problem. We'll look uh, at it next time. Yeah. Uh, Harry Drake was the big guy that made all these bows and he made hunting bows to Drake bows and everything like that. But he was really into the, the flight shooting. And um, so every bow that I ever shot was made by Drake. And he, when I'd get there, he'd give me the bow and, and the arrows and I'd shoot, you know, and we'd, you know, shooting an 80 pound uh, flight bow was not a problem because we shot a lot of heavy bows back then. Uh, Don, when Don, his normal everyday uh, bow, and he was a big Howard Hill fan, his normal every, everyday long bow was 125 pounds. Okay. And he had another one that was 140 that he shot a lot of animals with. I, and, and I watched him take that 140 pound longbow and the 60 pound recurve, put them both in his hand and pull them back and that, like it was nothing to it. And I could beat him arm wrestling. That's crazy. <laughs> it was just you know, special muscles for doing what he was doing, you know. Um, and uh, you, you know, when we ran Henderson's, our uh, he riches together, Every night we'd have a little contest. We'd go get uh, the bottle caps out of the, the Coke machine and, you know, we'd throw in the air. And if yeah. you missed, you had to buy. <laughs> <laughs> so, were you uh, were you hunting already at this point? Like you were hunting throughout your childhood? Because yeah. I know you're to this day and I don't want to I don't want to totally derail the conversation, but you you've been, you started bow hunting early. And I know you've shot multiple game animals with re recurves. I started bow hunting uh, when I got my little 20 pound Ben Pearson. Right. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 we right. Were shooting, we were shooting birds and whatever. Okay. So through college, through working Everything, for Easton, yes. you were, you were yep. hunting regular with, the, with a recurve. You bet. Yeah. Off the yep. shelf, you know, wood arrows, well, aluminum arrows. You're working well, mostly with. wood arrows. I mean, um, I remember one Christmas getting a full dozen set of uh, footed wood arrows. Uh, footed arrows were expensive back then. And I, oh man, I went out 
Christmas morning, shot them all on the target and watched the target fall over facing me. Oh. Broke every one of them. No way. I was devastated. I bet. Devastated. But yeah, everything with wood arrows, right? We didn't start shooting aluminum arrows. I didn't for hunting until I started work, working for Easton. <laughs> right. So that's what I said. Like if you're working for Easton, I'm sure you're I shooting. I could buy uh, seconds, right? That I would use for hunting. I could buy them for six bucks a dozen. It was cheaper than I could buy wood, right? So wow. I was hunting then with, with aluminum arrows. And that was a big deal, you know? We take the wood arrows and we when we went to Catalina hunting, we take a boat over and uh, I'd have a big barrel of wood arrows and a bunch of old stale bread and we'd throw them bread up there and seagulls would come in and we'd shoot the seagulls all the way over to Catalina. <laughs> <laughs> and at 500 bucks a piece, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> yeah. 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 But the, the captain just loved it. They said, yeah, shoot all you want. <laughs> But we'd have wood arrows and dead seagulls all the way out to Catalina. <laughs> so, matter of fact, the guy who, when I first went there to hunt, the guy who was running the concession was a guy named Jim Doherty, who was quite the famous bow hunter and writer and everything. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm putting out names that you don't know, but. No, yeah, you're way, yeah, I, 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 I will for sure. But it's not, I think, Dick, that's, that's okay. That's part of, I think that's part of the story and part of the, um, just the message behind you, what's developed you as a coach is there's a lot of people out there that coach archery that have never shot bare bow before. They might've dabbled with it, but they didn't, they don't have, you know, and I'm not claiming you as, you know, a bare bow coach. I'm just saying that your experience in archery definitely trumps the, the vast majority of all coaches in America, in my opinion. And I don't, I'm not saying that to be like, to pat you on the back, but like. Shoot, well, I've, go, I've been, I've been fortunate. I, I you, mean, yeah, I started, I started for sure. sport back when it was basically primitive there, they had just started putting uh, fiberglass on bows when I started. Right. Okay. So there were a lot of self bows being shot both in the United States and Canada. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically wood bows and, uh, you know, you had to learn how to shoot, you know, with all that stuff, you didn't have a sight, you had point of aim. Um, you had to, if you shot wood arrows, you had to clock your arrows, which meaning you had your arrows, all your arrows were numbered, right? And you, and you shoot it and say, number two went high, right? All right. Well, you knew that. So you'd aim it a little bit low left and that's the only way you could get them in the middle. Right. Um, because they're all shot different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, there's, there's a lot, I think there's a lot that goes into it. I think the, 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 the reason that I want to do this podcast series, the chapters of Dick Tone is because that history is important. Um, and and I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on Hewish a little bit, even like Justin talked about it when he came back to archery, he was like, you know, I'm standing here and people have no idea who I am. He's like, and it's not that I'm bothered by that. I'm bothered by the fact that people don't know like that. There's a two time Olympic gold medalist living and shooting now or living like right here. And they right. had no idea who he was. And, and I kind of like, you know, at the same token, you know, people, a lot of people, they, you've recently, come back into the limelight a little bit not a little bit quite a bit but people see casey and they assume that that well she shoots for the olympic team so you know kissick lee and i you know that's not necessarily the truth no. and i want not only do i want people to understand that but i want them to understand like you're coaching elite level olympic athletes but you started with a wood bow in your hand and shot competitive archery that way and you know, shot all and worked for the companies. You worked for AAE. We didn't even get to that point. You know, some of these old time, I guess it was Cavalier, I guess at the time, right? Is that, is that? We, we own Cavalier, but yeah. Uh, but know, I mean, just, I, so I, I want to go through that stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm all in to, to put it out there because the history 
it's a competitive archery. People know like the history of trad. They know the history of compounds, but the history of competitive archery and the fact that barebow is sort of like the closest thing in current competition archery that's that's a, to its authentic form is growing the way it is. I want well, people I to know. I, I think I told you in one of our little conversations here not too long ago that the NFAA from for years and years and years, I mean, the guy who actually was the NFAA champion, all around champion, was yeah. Barebow. Okay. Barebow recurve. Recurve Barebow. There yeah. was no compounds at the time. It, that was the guy. There were sight shooters that would shoot and they could beat the, the, the uh, um, Barebow guy, but not by much, but they could beat him, right? Yeah. But they weren't the champions. The only right, champion right. was the Barebow guy. Well, that's, that's kind of in America. That's sort of been Demer in some ways. That's honestly how Demer and I became friends. I was like a, you know, I just got back in Olympic recurve and shoot like five fifties, five sixties. And then Demer would show up and shoot like a five sixty five, five sixty eight, five seventy, And I'd be like, what? who the hell is this guy? <laughs> and, you know? And then I finally started shooting better and started shooting five seventies, five eighties. Uh, I think at 589 might have been like one of my highest uh, 60 era rounds. And then, you know, and then I switched and went to Barbo. And, you know, but anyways, that's that's kind of the same principle. Like, you're like Denver shoots scores that a lot of people can't shoot with Olympic recurve. Sure. You know what I mean? And, um, but anyways, I don't, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I like, I want to continue down the road we're on. And, and it's that, that history. We'll go for another, you know, whatever, a couple, you know, 20, 20 more minutes or half hour or so, but so, so let's kind of get back to your story. Um, I guess what you were, you, you had, uh, what went and had a 90 day reprieve you built again for NASA. Um, and where, well, I came back here and I came back in the, in the States. I actually was, uh, working for Henderson, but I ended up there. I ended up coaching a lot of people, um, and not only intercollegiate, but kids. I had kids that I would, you know, every Saturday, I'd have 15, 20 kids and individual less lessons, one right after another, you know, trying to learn to shoot, you know, five bucks a lesson. Fine, you know, that's, that's what it was back then. Um, one of the young ladies I started, she was eight years old, and her uh, her uncle was ten. <laughs> Strange deal, but uh, worked with both of them. Both of them ended up uh, national champions, and she ended up winning the ladies national champion at age nineteen, which at the time was the youngest that had ever done it. Okay, um, her name was Terry Pacho, um, and uh, yeah, she's still around. She's not shooting anymore, but you know, still around. But uh, and she made several teams and stuff like that. Um, you know, we had, in fact, she was Jay Barr's girlfriend for a while. Really? Yeah. Yeah, you dirty dog. <laughs> Before he met Janet, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just a lot of people I'd worked with over the years, um, a lot of U.S. team members, a lot of world team members. Um, and then I started working with uh, U.S. teams. Um, 1981 when USAT started. Oh, I was born, by the way. I was, I was three. Well, there you go. We got I was, it. I was three years old. There you go. So it, that was when USAT started. And uh, uh, I would go to the camps, but they wouldn't let me coach. I was just the equipment guy. Okay. So I was setting up equipment and make sure everybody was right and all that kind of stuff. And then um, I think it was 1984 or something like that or 85, whatever. Uh, they, they finally decided that they would, you know, let me work with some of the people, right? So we had a camp in Colorado Springs and we had the men and women and we had a, a, a going to have a session with just the women and they wanted me to talk about motivation. And I said, all right. So they figured that if I screwed this up, then I didn't have to worry about me anymore. At the time I'm coaching these kids are beating everybody, but they didn't want me to coach for some reason, you know, which is politics. So I, I, I <clears throat> we had this room and we had the top 10 ladies in there 
And then we had uh, Dr. Dan Landers, who's a sports psychologist there at Arizona State that we were working with there. <clears throat> Christine McCartney, who was a, a executive director then of NAA, a bunch of other people there and some of Landers people. Yeah, just for, <laughs> for some of the listeners, that NAA is National Archery Association. Uh, it was the right. original, it was the USA archery of my childhood, as a matter yeah. of fact. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. still, so right. that's what NAA is, but. <clears throat> so anyway, I had a whiteboard there and I started talking. I says, you know, the things that motivate people. And I wrote down fear and I wrote down money and I wrote down, I don't remember what, you know, and I just, oh, I stopped it. And I says, I forgot. And Christine was back there. Christine, I'll take care of it now. And I had a letter from Christine McCartney that had been written by the board that said that the ladies that are shooting or the US team ladies uh, have been kind of not uh, living up to, you know, their potential and uh, the scores aren't what are competitive internationally. So we've decided as a, an organization that we would not allow any US team members to go unless they can reach certain scores. And for the FIDA, which is the international round at the time, the score is 1250. You must have shot this 1250 in a competition uh, prior to making a team. Otherwise, you're not eligible. And of course, hands went up, you know. And uh, what if nobody, you know, can do it? What if nobody, that, and I said, well, I don't know, but I suppose they save money, you know. <laughs> they don't have to send you right right well that's not fair and that's and that and i said well we can discuss that later so and then i went on i talked about 45 minutes about motivation right and then i stopped and i picked up the letter and I held it up and i says this is a fake and they said what i says it's a fake so what do you mean it's a fake I said, I made it up. And every one of those girls were starting to get mad. And I and I I picked one out and I said, You look like you're a little bit upset. She says, I am. I said, What are you upset about? She says, I just spent 40 minutes sitting here figuring out how I'm going to do this to get that 1250. And now you tell me I don't have to do it. I says, Really? And I says, How about you? Same thing. I says, what do you call that? They go, what do you mean? I says, what do you call it? Yeah. I don't know. I says, that's motivation. That's <laughs> self-motivation. And that's the only motivation that counts, is self-motivation. If you don't have that, all this other stuff doesn't mean anything. Right. And they're all sitting there going, damn. You know? <laughs> and that was the end of the talk. Yeah. Dan Landers Stop. come up. Dan Landers came up afterwards and he says, I've been to a lot of motivational speak speaking. That's the best one I've heard ever. Okay. Because I made them think. Sure. That's so good stuff. that from that point on, they didn't have much problem letting me coach. Oh. It was <laughs> it was that easy, huh? <laughs> it was that easy. Yeah, not not anymore. Um, we had that conversation though. Yeah. Um let's so let's talk about then like what or you know hit hit the high points of your coaching career moving forward from there to that point well you know i ended up you know actually taking the world team to um, um lausanne in 89 uh we did the the spring arrow in russia in 1990 um i, I went to the 84 olympics and as as a helper even though I had, you know, people there I was working with. Um, and we had um, the 88 Olympics, same way they, they put me on the field as the equipment repair guy. So I had credentials, I could be on the field and work with Jay. And I had Jay Bars and, and Debbie Oaks were both um, on that team that kids that I had coached. And Jay ended up winning the gold and, um, and silver in this team and gold in the individual. And, uh, uh, Debbie won a bronze in the team, 
So that was successful. I ended up coaching the 92 Olympics. Um, it was horrible. <laughs> but anyway, I was in Barcelona. Yep. And, uh, yeah, and I enjoyed doing the thing, but the politics of it was, got so bad over there, it was just not good. Yeah, my so, coach's daughter went to the Barcelona Olympics. That was, Or no, she went to Seoul, Korea. Was she in 82? Melanie Skillman? Do you remember Melanie? Melanie Skillman was on the team with Debbie Oaks. And, and, I uh, thought so. Yeah. yeah. Melanie is um, Vi vibrant. A young lady. Yes, colorful. Yes. Yes. I yes. haven't talked to her in decades. No. Um, her dad was my my Olympic recurve coach when I was a kid, but and I shot with and against Melanie. Talk about motivation. Yeah. You know, Melanie, like, when you're uh, shooting against what's Debbie, that? Debbie Oaks and Denise uh, for all the team. Okay. Bronze medalist in the '88 Olympics, I believe. Yeah. Yes, that's where she got the bronze medal, which was fun. The uh, other. Uh, Denise was being uh, coached by Tim Strickland. Yeah. Okay. Right. And uh, it was it was a kind of interesting thing about that at the team round. Um, uh, Melanie missed the target during the team round, and so instead of taking silver, they ended up bronze. Right. When you know, and here's uh, Denise. She's a 14 year old kid. I remember. Walks off, walks off the, the the field. And here's a reporter sticks a, a mic in her in her face and said, "What do you think about your your oldest, most experienced archer missing the target and cost you the silver medal?" Fourteen year old kid, right? That's the first question. Here's the answer. You can't think of it that way, she said. You got to think about all the good arrows she shot to get us there in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. That's right now, you talk about somebody was right for the moment. That was Denise. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So. Again, that's part of that's part of history, part of archery that you won't hear unless we have this podcast and we have this this discussion. Um, and that's an era that I come from. So, like, I really appreciate. It. I watched those games. I shot next to those competitors. Denise wasn't much older than I am. Um, I shot with Melanie um, and probably watched Debbie shoot as well. And had no idea who I was looking at or what was going on, but that's that's pretty cool. So, um, you coach Jay. Maybe maybe next time I'll tell you the story about how we got Debbie on that team. Yeah, we can. Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. That I I I'd love to know um, and talk about a little bit more of that stuff. And again, you know, I, at the the validity of going through this conversation is to understand, you know. There's a lot of there's a lot of coaches out there, Dick, coaches, and they're not they don't you know they're coaching based off of what somebody else told them, not right. experience. I'm, right. I I coach off of experience. I don't coach off of what somebody uh, a certificate, and you know I really have a, a profound appreciation for what you've developed and the way that you've done it and the people, the fact that you're still cranking out amazing quality shooters in kids nonetheless let alone adults so you know i've picked your brain multiple times we're probably going to work together a little bit uh in the future as long as we can collaborate our schedules but it's just one of those things that you know a lot of the barebell world might not even know who you are and it's not your fault or it's not the fault of archery it's the fact that they're so enveloped in barebow they don't realize there's this whole other base of knowledge available um you know and when we get to the last part of this when we start talking about like what you've developed why you teach it you know how it's been successful and again multiple gold medalists multiple olympians um olympic medalists to, for that you know people should pay attention not just ride a system or not just do as I say, because I told you what to do. You know what I mean? I always, so. I always say there's a lot of ways to shoot a bone arrow. Ton of, Bearbo ton of proves ways. that. Bearbo yeah. proves that. It yeah. doesn't matter. I mean, there's a lot of different forms. I mean, we had, we had people like Jerry Polipchik back in the day that, um, you know, you'd watch him shoot and I wouldn't teach that way, but yeah. I guarantee you, he could put him in the middle. You Rick, know? Rick McKinney. 
Rick McKinney. <laughs> yeah. Rick, Rick was one of the best we've ever had. Yeah. I mean, he didn't, he did a lot of it his own way, but in, in retrospect, if you look at his shot, it was a good shot. Yeah. It really was. It was, it, it, the principles were all there. Um, but I mean, this kid was unbelievable. He just kicked butt. He was good. We talk about that in Barebo deck that, you know, there's, there's multiple ways to shoot barebow and to shoot it and make it work. Mm -hmm. The, the shoot ups at the classic year after year prove that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely some, there's some qualities of the barebow shot that people should pay attention to. And it may produce a more repeatable and easier to repeat shot, I should say. Um, but, you know, we'll get into those discussions down the road. We don't, we don't need to go that route now. Um, so your, your coaching experience didn't end with Jay and Debbie. Where did it go after that? Well, you know, I had, I had a young lady I worked with, uh, Judy Adams, and she made the uh, 96 team. Uh, she, was, she worked with Al Henderson and was on the 1980 team. Okay. Okay. Uh, he had two people on that team. Uh, can you tell me how many medals we won that year? What year? 1980. No, I was two years old. I'm not going to know that. <laughs> you said you're good at history. What? Well, no, I didn't say I was good at history. I said I appreciate history. But yeah, I have no idea. How many medals did we win? Zero. Okay. In any sport. Oh, okay. All right. When one medal in any sport. Okay. And I, and then 84 Olympics was you know Los why? Angeles, right? You know why? No, I'm not a clue. We boycotted that year. We did. We did. The eighties. Why? Why did we boycott? Jimmy Carter boycotted the Olympics because you know, of the, the, the Russian, it was in Moscow. Oh okay. yeah. 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 Okay. War. I, I do okay. remember that. I do remember All right. that. And then the next year when in 84, when it was in LA, the Russians boycotted. Oh, tit for tat. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, Mary, Mary Lou Retton, she loved that. <laughs> yeah, I remember that too. Yeah. Uh, because none of the Russian gymnasts were there. She did, pre she did pretty well, though. I do remember yeah. watching that as a kid. Won, like but anyway, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, anyway, uh, after the 96 Olympics, and I, I, I after the 92 Olympics, yeah. the... Uh, uh, the politics got so bad, you know, and I had my own archery company, the Cavalier. Cavalier, and, which uh, I still have some of your tabs at my shop. That's what I shot as an Olympic recurve shooter. And uh, we, you know, we were doing pretty well with it. And um, uh, there were people in the industry that, you know, in the sport that decided that they wanted to take me down and my business. So I just said to hell with it. And I dropped out of working with, NAA at all yeah about 1992 and I did some individual people in 96 and some under that after that but nothing really and and uh you know got into the golf business and did a bunch of other stuff and watched my kids grow up and play golf and my daughter ended up going to ASU and playing four years for them on a full ride scholarship and my son ended up being one of the best golfers in the state and uh no, I didn't do anything with them until after we sold the company in 2005. And then wow. at that time, I'm still, I'm enjoying myself. We're, you know, I work for, for uh, we sold it to AAE and I worked for them for a couple of years and then uh, went off and did some guiding and stuff like that. And I was having a good time until Jay called me up and he says, hey, the Canadians need a coach. You need to apply. And I said, why would I want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous, you know. And uh, I had already been conned into doing some classes at uh, Archer headquarters, the local shop here. And I was, you know, coaching some people that wanted individual lessons after that. And, uh, but, you know, I said, all right, what the hell? I mean, I learned target archery up there. I owe them something. So I applied. So the guy named Alan Bromps, who was the head of the uh, 
uh, high performance manager I had to apply to him yeah. and um, so the, the lady who was the coach up there at the time is Joan McDonald which was Joan Galley which if you go back you remember yeah in 1964 right yep so anyway he gets this thing from me and he and you know it's a, a resume or whatever and you know an application calls up Joan and he says some guy named Dick Tone applied for this do you know him <laughs> <laughs> and of course she's laughing her ass off you know why would he want to do this right well as it turned out I ended up you know uh, working with them for I think two and a half years uh, as a consultant and working with the teams and you know trying to get them going the right direction and it was kind of fun because we went to the Olympic test event in Rio and um, the the men's team end up second okay and so it was it was looking like they're going to win a medal until uh -huh. one of the guys turned positive after Arizona Cup to a uh -huh. man substance that was in his his uh, what do they call it uh, supplements or supplements and stuff you yeah. know they, they're not regulated you don't know what's in them Right. And we kept telling him not to take this stuff, but he did, and he ended up positive and got banned. So that screwed up the team big time. Otherwise, they probably would have meddled, you know, because yeah. they were good. They were good. So. so two years coaching the national team in Canada, right? Helping them out, yeah. Helping John them out. Was, John right. was just official coach, and I was just, you know, gotcha. consultant helping them out and stuff like that, so. Um, and then where, where did your career go after that? Well, once that kind of ended and I came back here, I was just working with people individually. That's it. You know, yeah. work with any of the teams. Um, and, uh, you know, I had, uh, you know, some good, good ones coming along and which I still do. Um, the one young man, Jackson, he won the, the flights there, uh, uh, uh Vegas at Vegas the flight yeah. one which is, that's tough to do. Sure. So 291, 296, 295, which is pretty fair. Yep. That, what was that? That was what, 2000? This year in Vegas. Oh, this year? Yeah. Oh, I thought, I'm thinking of the, uh, is this the same shooter that you coached before? Yep. Yep. Okay, okay, okay. Well, let's go, let's you talk go about back. that. Let's talk back. about that. Yeah. I heard a young lady um, that I started with, uh, Whitney Jensen. And uh, I, she was 12, I guess, when I started with her. And that was in uh, January of 2016. This, this sort of is the introduction of how you ended up coaching Casey. So that's why I want you to cover Actually, that. January of 2015, I started working with her. Okay. And the very next year, I told her, I said, if you can shoot 285, she was a cub, on the 60 centimeter target, uh, I'll get you, I'll take you to Vegas. You know, she says, all right. Well, she ended up shooting a 288 less than a year shooting okay year so, from picking up the bow a bow ever right okay it's, a, import, have, it's an important detail that's why i want to you know i have videos of everything from the, where she started all the way through mm -hmm. i always start them corner of the mouth sure right and even if they want to shoot a sight I and mean, that doesn't matter i start them that way because that gets them the right position um physically okay and um, anyway so we're going to take her to Vegas. And I had Jackson, who was going to be his second year there. And so Whitney's division, there was 89 girls. And one of the girls in there was Casey. Yep. And Whitney ended up beating them all. Casey ended up fourth. And I knew Rob, and he was there. I had Rob on teams with me back when he was a shooter. He was a good shooter. Yep. And he'd been on, you know, ES teams and all that kind of stuff. And then Jackson was in Connor, Connor's division. That's Coffold, uh, we're talking about everyone. Yeah. And Jackson ended up winning it, shot uh, 292, 297, right? Uh, this is on the big target, the 60 centimeter target. And he's watching Jackson shoot the 297 on the three that were out had to be called. And he says, Does this kid ever miss? And I says, No, not often, you know. And so here's uh, Rob says, all right, you got to come and do a seminar. 
for us, you know, at Lancaster. I says, all right, well, I guess so. All right. You know, same time I'm working with Canadians and I'm thinking if I'm going to do a seminar, I got to have a, 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 some sort of a, um, you know, a presentation, you know, some, yeah, some, yeah. some, some one way of doing it. And I didn't know anything about PowerPoint or any of that kind of stuff, you know. So no, but you could well, type. <laughs> no, but you could type. We figured that out. Right. I got and, you to, uh, to NASA. Anyway. Alan Bromps, who was our, you know, at Canada, our high performance guy, he um, he knew all that kind of stuff. So I asked him if he could help me put together a, a presentation. He says, send me some content. So I did. And we met in Medellin during the uh, Continental Qualifier. And we're sitting there having breakfast. And I says, how's that uh, PowerPoint presentation coming? He says, well, not at all. And I said, why is that? He says, do you realize how much content you sent me? I said, no. <laughs> he says, you sent me 25,000 words. <laughs> I'm having a hard time putting that into 25 slides. <laughs> yeah. So it, anyway, we end up that week putting together a, a start to a presentation. Yeah. And then I had a couple of four hour flights going home and I spent most of that time you know, I learned a little bit about PowerPoint from him and I was revising and doing things. And by the time I got home, I had a presentation. Yeah. And that was the first part of May. And we did our first uh, seminar at the end of May uh, in 2016. And Casey and Connor were both in that seminar. And that's where I started working with Casey. Okay. And from that point on, I don't think she's lost a tournament. She owns all the records. She has all the records uh, for Olympic recurve. Uh, she, I mean, maybe some head to head matches, but I don't like tournaments for her age group. I don't know. Other than, know, you know, I mean, if she would get senior, but yeah, yeah, no, there's no question. There's definitely, you know, and I I've known Casey and Rob and Connor and Carol for, well, since I was a child, I, my father bought my first Olympic recurve off of Rob. Yep. and at Lancaster Archery so like we have history and then you know I got back into the sport and these two kids are running around and I'm like oh they're archery shop kids you know what I mean I remember Casey working behind the counter and, and you know and then when she really the there was a change in her demeanor as a shooter when she started working with you in my opinion and you see that to this day you know there's a there's there's just this there's this way about her that she's so much she's just kind of like an old soul with an with a bow in her hand and well, i don't know how else to explain she's a very hard worker she's a very hard worker too sure yeah yeah you know yeah the good thing about casey is that is that she was a gymnast yep okay and um gymnast I mean, if you have a young man or young woman that's been a gymnast, all right, they've always they've learned work ethic. They've learned they've got upper body strength. They've learned uh, uh, all the how to move their body, uh, the kinesthetic yeah, sense, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. they can pick up any sport and do sure. it better than anybody else. Yep. All right. So that that was one of the things that really helped Casey, and would help any young man or young woman. Okay. So if you want to build a bunch of archers, go get a bunch of people that from gymnastics. Sure. Well, I mean, and just, just to piggyback off of that dick, like that's what got me back into competition archery was competition Olympic weightlifting. Like that's, and that's what got me back in because it's the mindset that you need to perform in those situations. It's the same mindset when you're standing on a shooting line. And I try to explain that to people and even so in the fire service too, a little bit, I've had this discussion with a few people, you know, being a fireman, I'm in situations where I have to make decisions that it could affect somebody else's life or my own. Like you need to be able to pick up and, and you need to make, be decisive and you need to make a decision. What are you going to do? Yeah. You know, and, and, and on standing on a shooting line, you know, it's a lonely place. Like it's you and your thoughts. You need to know, how to manage those thoughts because it's just what it is what it is, you know? Um, you know, and your seminar does a good, a good, a very good job of painting that picture in my opinion, you know, 
it, it makes people maybe look at archery from a little bit of a different angle. Plus you're giving the form, you know, you're really with the, with, especially if you take the one at Lancaster, you're, you you get the camera angles and the form reviews and the, the, the work and the drills and, and you know, uh, like some of the shooting stuff that you do, which I started doing my own seminars. I don't do any of the stuff that you do, but I, I like, I'm, I'm a drill heavy type of coach. I like drills. Drills are, are, and, and it's like, it's like other sports that I've done and coached. It's just like the same, it's the same concept. I like to, to come up with and do drills that um, mimic aspects of the shot or, or refining areas of the shot, stuff like that. Like that's, that's, that's my approach to coaching. And, and it, some people like that. Some people don't. Um, well, when in doing these seminars, and I hadn't done any kind of seminar since I had worked with U.S. teams back in the 80s. And so doing this seminar, it, you know, we put it on, they put it up, and it took, took over two months for them to get 20 people to sign up for the first seminar. Okay. Yeah. We did another one in November of that year. And uh, they put it online and it filled 30 people in 12 minutes. Wow. So it, it's kind of been that way ever since. And once they put it online, it fills up really quickly. Yeah, Rob. Well, I had talked to Rob about taking your seminar. And when they put that seminar live, Rob sh shot me a text and was like, are we are talking? No. Yeah, he called me actually because we were we were talking about it. He was like, Hey, the seminar's up, but you want to sign up quick. I'll make sure you get a spot because it's going to sell out fast. Yeah. I, I talked to him previous about like, I want to take this seminar. I want to take the seminar with Dick. I want to know, you know, I want to understand what he's teaching and why he's teaching it. And then I ended up with the back issues and it could have been a better timing to be completely honest with you. But we did, uh, we did one in Salt Lake there, I think the next year. Uh, and um, we ended up with 42 people, way too many. Yeah, um, that's got to be tough. Yeah, but we had, and uh, you know, I did the first one by myself. After that, I says, I can't do this. And I kind of conned Jay into helping me. Yeah. So that didn't hurt. And then the, in the one in Salt Lake, we had uh, Jay and I had George Tekmachoff there helping out. Uh, Rob was there helping out. And then uh, Brett Lister is a kid I'd coached that was running the center at the time. He was helping. So we had four or five coaches and we could put them in groups and just move them around and to help them shoot and stuff like that. So it worked out, but it, yeah. it, there's too many people. Sure. Yeah. So you're, you're coaching Casey Caulfield, um, yeah. amazing young talent. Uh, one of the, one of the many kids over the years, but in recent vintage, I should say teenagers that has taken the seniors uh, starting with, I want to say the first time I saw Casey compete against the adults and take, uh, a win was the Lancaster Archie classic. I think in 2018, maybe 17, I'm trying she to actually, think she actually won the national target. Okay. I can't remember what year. She's won it now four times. So go back four years. Yeah. Four okay. Times. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so 2018. Yeah. That, uh, McKenzie. Brown was the national champion. Yep. And they went head to head down to the very last end. And Casey won with by two points. Yep. She what that and she 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 won the classic against McKenzie. Yeah. Because she shot a single spot through the shoot-ups. And I remember just like Rob was super emotional. And Connor won that year as well. So yep. you were coaching both of them that year. Right. So I mean, it's just, you know, I I guess. It's just, uh, it kind of brings everything full circle. Connor's now one of the top shooters at Texas A&M. Casey's one of the, one of, if well, now the top shooter in America um, at 17 years old uh, and just an all around good kid. I, I'm sure, I don't think Casey will watch this, but yeah, Casey, just, we're giving you a thumbs up. You're a good kid. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. She's a good kid. Hey, silver medalist in the world championship this year. Right. Silver medalist, world championship, Olympic athlete, you know, so you've, you've really, uh, you continue to produce shooters and you're not, you know, you're doing the same thing 
maybe a little bit evolved that you've been doing for decades. So yeah, uh, yeah, same thing. So, and I think what we'll do, Dick, is I think this is a good place to sort of close out this first chapter uh, of Dick Tone. And I think we'll talk more about power archery uh, next episode. Um, and maybe like we'll we'll get into the evolution of what has become your seminar and what you're teaching and what sets Casey apart from from maybe some other shooters and and the multitude of shooters and like what is it that makes that difference what is it that that the details of it um and then then we're going to look at you know whether whether we are able to do it the next episode or maybe add a third you know where do we start applying this to barebo and and where do we where do we make changes maybe even changes with my own shooting that because i'm not i'm not somebody that's going to um I'm not going to just do something and promote it and not, and not do it. Like I told you, I can give you points. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. We're absolutely going to talk about that. I, we, the problem is, is that you're in Arizona and I'm in Pennsylvania. I'd rather work with you one-on-one to, 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 to talk yeah, about yeah. it, but we can work be, that out. I'm not it worried. It should about be one-on-one. It. Yeah. So if you come to, <laughs> if you happen to come to PA to, to be with Casey, we'll try to hook up or, or vice versa, or, or if I can come to Arizona cup, um, or something like that, I am supposed to go to San Diego in June for a barebo seminar. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's something there, but we'll, we'll work that out. I'm not worried about it. Um, no but we'll, you know, I, I want people, I want people to get it from, from your mouth, what you teach and, and, you know, where it goes because your seminar was very good and like in and in my opinion you know your approach is super super beneficial for barebow shooters regardless of whether you adopt the shot cycle there's more things to it and that's what i that all of it i want people to know um and they need and that's sometimes as as we have said multiple times in barebow um you can make almost any form work in some capacity if you put the time and effort into it. Okay. But, but there's other things to archery and there's other ways to, to prepare yourself and to, you know, to approach the sport and you do a good job of teaching that. And I, that's the other stuff. That's important details that other coaches don't do, you know, or, or certifications. They don't, they're not really teaching you how to be a better archer. They're just teaching you a system and that's not enough. It's not enough. So, but anyways, I'm preaching to the choir, you know, um, I think that's it. My guys, is there anything else you want to talk about? I mean, it's, I think we got it this time it's been probably longer than you wanted to go. It is, but that's okay. It's good information and it's, it just makes for a really good episode. So Dick, thanks for joining me for this first chapter. We'll, We'll, we'll hook up over the next week or two before to go into chapter two and, and talk about this other stuff. Um, and, uh, and we'll chat, we'll chat one-on-one about, about some of the changes. I will tell you, you're, you're the, a lot of people out there have seen my videos and my discussion about the drop away on the AAE free flight. Mm-hmm. I, um, I had that. Do you remember, remember when you were working with me at the seminar and I had, I, I had the bent, uh, the bent wire. I got rid of the bent wire just so you know it. I, I think what was happening, the bent wire worked well with like a, a, a 0.166 arrow. Mm-hmm. And now I've gone back to the regular wire still in drop away mode though. I freaking love that. I think it's great. Yep. And I was getting weird highs and lows that didn't make sense. My heavy arrow was just it it must if i if i didn't have a real fluid release the arrow i was either sticking between the the plunger and the wire or something was happening i was getting random highs and lows i put the regular a wire back on my free flight still in drop away mode gone i mean incredible (laughs) improvement so but you're the you're the guy that that so everyone knows He's the guy that showed me the drop away mode on the free flight. And I don't know if I'll ever go back. Well, it's, um, it's one of the patents I have in archery. Is it really? I did not know that. The free flight or just the free, the free flight. 
that's your patent. I had no idea. Yep. Look at you. I love, I, well, AA is a sponsor of the podcast, but besides that, I love that rest. It's that, that was a Cavalier rest. We did that in 1992. Yep. Had those. Okay. Yeah. So 20 years ago. That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> that's all I shot Cavalier stuff when I, when I was a kid. So I originally did that for the ACE arrow because it was so lightweight and if it touched anywhere, it, it affect where the arrow went. So right. if the wire isn't there, it can't touch. That's crazy. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, it works great. It absolutely yeah. positively works great. I've, I know, uh, I had, I did not know that you had the patent on that, nor that I, I described that rest as it's built like a brick shit house wall. A lot of people won't know what that is, but a brick shit house is basically an outhouse and it's that that rest is just bulletproof i love it i absolutely love it so but anyways all right we're gonna call it a night uh thanks for joining me dick it was a very good conversation i love the history side of it and all the details next time everyone we're gonna get into power archery we're gonna talk about dick's approach what he learned why he learned it why he promotes it and and hopefully if not next episode, the, the last episode, talk about the natural shot cycle, what Dick is teaching, and we'll we'll kind of we'll dive into that discussion. So have a good night, everyone. Dick, you have a good night. Thank you for joining me. We'll talk yep. soon. Yep. See you, everyone. See you, Dick. See you.